All right. So let's let's move on to the fort checking a bit. Um, and I, I'm, I, I guess I'll maybe initiate going back to your comment, Rick, about uh, um, your fellow, former student saying stop angling and and start going straight on um, as as is almost always the case for me in hockey. It's not always this or always that. There's a there's a time and a place to be um, straight on pressure and there's a time and a place where angling is not just appropriate, but it's the preferred um, method. And part of it falls to what are you trying to accomplish with your forecheck? Um, so I don't, I don't agree with his statement, stop teaching angling, because angling is critical for a lot of situations in the game, um, including forechecking. But it's not a blanket thing. It's a read and react thing for me. Rick, I just wanted to mention when uh, you mentioned that straight on, I, I watched Germany play. <clears throat> and uh, they they were in a one two two. They were they weren't necessarily angling. It was sort of a neutral zone trap one two two for they had a two nothing lead. And that surprised me because I was looking for this aggressive head on play. And I think I texted you, you know, that I had watched that. And then in the third period, they went to straight at the puck. They went to 2-1-2, two, two, which is straight at the puck. And so I, I just started to look at the nuances of it. And the other thing I got out of watching Germany, Tim, was I, I watched uh, Sider, that 20-year-old from Germany. Yeah, he's a good player. He's a, a really good player. So uh, go ahead, Rick, on the forecheck, because I know you've, and you you were the torpedo expert, and for those of you here, uh, uh, I'm very familiar with the torpedo because I uh, know Shannon Miller, who's done presentations to NHL coaches on it, and I also uh, scouted the Swedes, practice their torpedo in the one practice time they had, the entire practice was based on that five-man system, and it was like <coughs> un <coughs> unbelievable at practice. So I was quite fearful of it, and I wouldn't know how to play against it executed that well. But I'm not sure how it's evolved for you, and I know Tom Malloy has played with that torpedo, and I've always envisioned it to be sort of like a, Two one two or a two two one, but terminology is terminology. They got to figure out what they're doing when they're out there. You give them the structure. So, Rick, go ahead if you don't mind. Yeah, thanks. Um, just to to you know, kind of back up a little bit. I, I I played for for Tom Watt at the University of Toronto and played for some coaches that were big on on what Tom taught. So. I grew up playing man-on-man -man defense, very strict man-on-man -man defense in the zone, even to the point where we didn't even sag the high slot winger from the defenseman. We we stayed right on, on him. And so, you know, I've always kind of taught that to all my, my teams only because I think it develops defensive play skills. So, you know, I kind of break it down. And, and again, this is very simplified, but I break it down to three different defensive things that you need to do in the zone. One is play a man coming out of the corner with the puck. Secondly, covering someone in the, in the slot, or we'll call it, you know, kind of in the house, because it's not just right in front of the goalie. And then covering a point man appropriately. So, you know, those are the three skills that I teach inside man on man. But I feel even with my weakest players, that they get better on their defensive play when they're being forced to cover one man and make sure he doesn't score. And and I actually took that philosophy to um, the Brampton Thunder, where I had, you know, seven or eight candidates for the national women's team on the team. And I said, look, we're going to play man on man till Christmas time, just so that you all get better at playing uh, a one on one in our zone. So and and it was nice to, to have a couple compliments, you know, after we went to the zone defense about how those skills had had progressed. So, you know. Take that then to the the torpedo where, you know, to simplify that 
quickly is you play kind of with two forwards or two strikers, two midfielders and one defender. So you've actually got kind of three waves of players, kind of a soccer style instead of having just forwards and, and defense. And so, you know, the criticism of it is that you need to kind of have two really good two way centers to be your midfielders. But obviously there's defensemen that can step into that position and there's forwards that can. Um, but it, it dovetails nicely. It, it's easy to play man on man with that setup because you've still got, you know, kind of your two midfielders and your defender down low and you've got your two, two torpedoes at the top covering the defenseman. And, and of course, the whole idea of the torpedo is that those, uh, those torpedoes are flying the zone really quickly and pushing the play down the ice. Um, so, you know, that, that's kind of a nice, nice uh, piece to that. Part of my, my philosophy on coaching is to simplify the team stuff for players so that they, they're never out there going, where did coach say I was supposed to be in this situation? I want them to kind of feel the game naturally. And I think the way to do that is to make it as simple as possible. So sorry to, to give that kind of pre, prelude to the forecheck piece. But, you know, for 20 years, I taught what I call the one, two, three, four check. The first man in goes right at the puck carrier and, and forces um, a pass. The third man in the zone, meaning the one, two, three. So the third man takes the high slot. And, and I always kind of sold the second man as the only guy that has to think. He's the mongoose. And I call it the mongoose because mongoose can catch cobras in mid, mid strike. So you have to be quick and, and anticipate but I let my, my F2 go wherever he thinks the puck's going to go. So if he thinks it's going to go D to D, go right to the far defenseman. If he thinks it's going to come up the boards to the winger, go right to that winger. Uh, if he thinks that F1's going to create a, a turnover in the corner, you go right into the corner to pick the puck up. But that F2 person has to, has to pick up uh, wherever the puck's going to be. Like he's the puck hunter. So when we moved to the torpedo system... Now it was great because I actually had four four checkers and I was allowed to kind of say, look, now we're going to make sure we take the D to D pass away and we're going to take away the pass up the boards and we're going to still have an F3 who is actually F4 in the high slot. And um, but my, my big issue with the torpedo, although I love it, um, is it's very difficult to be out recruiting players to a program and say, hey, I think you'd make a really good halfback in our system. And, and so you have to kind of sell this whole different nomenclature and, and system of play. And, and when you've got kids that you're recruiting that you know, want to move on to junior and college hockey, they think this is going to be a detriment to their development because they're not playing kind of regular hockey. So you know, I was trying to figure out how to kind of meld the two things together. And before the start of not this past season, because it was kind of just a practice season, but the season before, I decided that, you know, I can teach our our systems without the puck in in 30 seconds. I'm just going to say to my players, whenever we don't have the puck, we're going to play man on man. So we're going to go and make sure that we pick up a man everywhere on the ice whenever we don't have the puck. So it's the same thing we're doing in the zone, but now we're doing it, you know, on the forecheck, on the neutralized forecheck. And the idea is that we want to take away all of the passes available for the puck carrier. So if the puck goes in the corner, our, F, our, our first man is right on that man. We've got a second man going right to their other defenseman so that they can't go D to D. I got another another four checker going right to the boards and picking up the winger there, and then and then our two defenders really, pick up, um, you know, their other wingers wherever they might be, but they're responsible for those guys. So as long as no one gets beat one on one, and and guys know that they can't be beat one on one because everybody's picking up a man. A man. So this comes back to the whole you know, Tony Soderholm saying, look, let's go right after the guy instead of angling. And, and Tim, back to your point, you know, we still teach angling and those skills involved, but we tell our F1s to go right at the defenseman to make him make a, a decision. But if we're taking his passes away, then it's a, it's even a tougher decision for that guy to make. And, and someone once said to me, you know, 
why let them bring the puck 200 feet down the ice when we have to go back 200 feet to score a goal? You know, if we can get the puck back inside their blue line, I, I think we're, we're doing our offense uh, a big service and, uh, and get more chances to score. And I, I would say that in our league with, you know, a, a, a last place, second to last place team, so we weren't as talented as some of the top teams, um, we were extremely effective on our forecheck and, and creating scoring chances by making it tough for the other team to, to move the puck whenever they had it. Did I cover all the things there, Wally? Yeah, I was just looking at who's, somebody's got their hand up, whoops. Oh, it's uh, Wally, go ahead. Yeah, I just, uh, Dominic and I, uh, the thing I get out of this, and and I think Tom Malloy might have some co comments on it. I There's just no free play and thinking within the system any system, whether it's one, two, two, and you do this and you do that. And uh, Dominic came up with what he experienced in uh, with his female team playing in a tournament, Dom, uh, which is the ultimate to me, will they ever get there? Because they're just playing and doing it themselves without thinking about it with your direction. Dom, can you talk about that? Yeah, I, I, you know, just looking through and, you know, having played in Switzerland for almost a decade, uh, DeVos played the torpedo, so I'm very, very familiar with it um, in regards to having, you know, the two forwards, the midfielders and the fence and, um, you know, uh, a couple comments and um, I, I agree, you know, and again, trying to oscillate between the pro game, which I just got out of and then, you know, kind of equate it back to to minor hockey um you know i agree there needs to be pressure on the on the first guy the first guy coming in i i tend to disagree a little bit on not having a bit of a path to to push them one way or the other i think you talk about you know to being able to anticipate um you know and again I, hey I, i'm not saying that you you know you take a wide you know path to be able to you know but there has to be a little bit of of push one way or the other, because otherwise the guys behind you are going to have to wait that that extra second to be able to, and you know, players be able to move it so quick they'll be able to play through you quick because you'll always be a step late. We call it the skinny. San Jose did it against us. Uh, I know McClellan um, and DeBoer. I think are were similar in that. Where the first guys hunting, the second guys anticipating. Very very similar in that regard. Um, now kind of transitioning to the the girls and how we did so you know i i basically try to simplify it and I, and I really agree with that point as far as simplifying it basically the three p's was uh pressure possession and play and so the pressure piece and i i put two players on um you know and so and basically i said hey it's a race to be number one because i found that if i say one two that they're you know someone's always waiting so it's a race to be number one number one's in there pressuring obviously there's a read in that that comes into play as far as that you know where's the d like where's the d going is you know is his only option to wheel and whatever whatever it is uh three above same same idea as as you um you know it's uh, i'm assuming four is a strong side pinch on your point so four would be strong side and then the five um, I would say, you know, because there's teams that are going to blow somebody high all the time, for, for, uh, you know, and so you're, you've got to be cognizant. If you're five, you've got to be cognizant um, of where, if there's somebody behind. And so again, it's, we all know how fluid the game is. And, um, you know, I, I found, and again, it's, it's a work in progress. Um, obviously we'd have pucks go east, west, one and two, um, you know, would would have to become four or five, and there wouldn't be the re the reload in the track through the middle, and there would be a little bit late, and there'd be breakaways. I mean, I, that that was a, you know um, you know when when teams they started to hard rim around to try to get to try to catch us, um, and again, it's to me and and the one thing I'll, I'll 
you know, I'm a little bit wary of is, you know, the man on man when not have the puck, you know, the one thing you said, well, you just can't get beat one on one. You know, I think, you know, as an offensive guy, I, I you know, hey, for sure, you're going to have to fight through checks. But if I can draw somebody in and I can make a quick t- couple touches, like there's going to be a lot of room to be able to 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 be able to come in. So, again, I, I guess my philosophy is a little bit different um, in regards to um, having la- having layers in the defensive zone. And I know, um, you know, we've played against a lot of teams in, you know, in, you know, the American League where they were strictly man on man that, you know, but you knew that if you beat your man off the wall, you're going to get a chance. And you knew that if you moved it and you beat your guy off the wall, like the guy came in hard because the guys were <laughs> pressuring hard, you moved it, you're able to get the, to the inside um, you know, and we, we worked on that small area play to be able to make those two two quick passes. And now you, you, you're pretty much guaranteed to, be, be, to have a chance a lot of the time. So, again, it's 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 something we wrestled with continually um, with with uh, in the Flames organization. I know they made some changes. Bill Peters, when he was there, he would have the D pressuring, you know, almost to the almost to the blue line. Uh, if they were on, on guys because they really wanted that pressure. And then when Troy Ward took over, uh, had the D basically as like the Boston, the Boston system where the D would like would go no higher than the hash a lot of times. So as he was coming up, there was almost a handoff. So you had your your centerman was so critically important. Now you think of Boston, they have some elite centermen, some of the best in the game and Krejci and, and Bergeron. Um, you know, they're a- they were able to play that system. You know, Calgary has some good pieces as well in Backland and in, in Lindholm. Um, but there, there, there was a little bit of a, you know, there were some issues with it. Right. And, and at our level, um, you know, under the Peters era, it ended up like we had, um, uh, I think it's Todd. I, I could be, it's one of the Woodcrofts that's in Bakersfield was under McClell- McClelland and had, uh, an extremely active uh, ozone, and he had these like you think of uh, Ethan Bear and Caleb Jones and uh, Bouchard that was there, and they were extremely active. So under Peters, it was well, we're not playing man on man, um, but if the D start moving, then you know you've got you've got to go you've got to go with them. If you're a winger, you got to go with them. So it turned on man on man, like it turned into that after after a low to high D to D and now an activation. Uh, Chicago roll all of a sudden we're in a man on man and now we're just cha- we're chasing around and we'd have extended possessions and then they would get ozone changes and then it was just it was it was a nightmare that way so you know I guess that's where my hesitation is with the man on man personally I think obviously uh, personnel plays a role in the strong center but I again and, and I use the example of why would you want to have Johnny Goodrow around the front of the net Right. Like you, you get a D that comes down, you get, you know, an active D that gets down. And now Johnny Goodrow is the guy that has to box out. So, um, you know, for me, uh, having the D close to the net, staying close to the net, having the center being the guy that checks off again, there's a lot more, a lot more to unpack. But um, yeah, that's and, and again, you know, it's but I the one thing I, I definitely agree on is uh, just as far as systematically uh, taking as as much, um, you know, black and white out of it, right? The, the, there has to be a, con- a concept that the players are able to read, so. Dom, just related to man-on-man in the D zone, and Tim, before you speak, uh, I think Vancouver might have been the first NHL team to play man-on-man in the D zone. And uh, I remember... Uh, players would come off the ice after being scored on with that coverage, and it was their excuse. I had my man. I had my man. And that was one of the first things I heard, complaints from coaches, is players, okay, I got my man. As long as I got my man, we're good. But, boy, there's times you switch. You have to switch. And I think that's where the game has evolved to what you're talking about, Dominic, and the trading off in Boston or whatever. Okay, go ahead, Tim. Yeah, thanks, Wally. Yeah, it's a it's been a long, long time debate. 
um, you know, man on man. I've always been sort of a what they call in ba- basketball a matchup zone defense, where it's sort of half man on man, half zone. Um, but sort of, sort of to your point, Dom, because there's there's pluses and minuses. Yeah, why would you want Johnny Gaudreau down low defending um, in the D zone? But also, if Johnny Gaudreau's got the puck in the offensive zone and he's going up the wall with a D on him, why would you want to give Johnny Gaudreau extra time and space by trying to do that handoff thing? And and your point's well taken. Like Cassidy is a an old school guy who played in Chicago back in the old days. They were a man on man down low team as Detroit was back when I was playing. Um, there's pluses and minuses to both. Both, uh, you know, Vegas uh, when Gallant was there again, old old time Detroit guy. He they were very much man on man, and you know, since the board's been there, they've switched up a little bit. And I I think the there are two sort of salient points for me. <clears throat> Number one, with the five-player offense that's so prevalent now in the in the NHL and maybe at, uh, more so at all levels of hockey, I think hockey is kind of changing. And if, if you're going to be content to play a packet-in zone, you also have to be content to maybe be stuck in your own zone for long stretches of time because teams are going to be able to possess the puck a lot more. I, I've always, and Wally and I have debated this uh, for for years and years. I've always been a guy who's taken the perspective as a defenseman. If I'm covering Dom Pittis, who's a really skilled guy, going up the wall in, in my own zone, if I'm covering Dom and he gets to the hash marks, why would I want to just drop off and leave him and give him time and space. One of one of the truisms in the NHL is when you're playing against skilled players, you want to pressure them as quickly as you can to limit their time and space because it's your best chance for them to not be able to pick you apart, so to speak. Lots of them will still make a good play. <coughs> the skilled players, time and space, they're always going to find a good play. And if you pressure them, they might, but they might not. And they might be forced into a cycle or a bad pass. So for me, it, it's it's a hybrid. Again, it's not always this, always that. Two things for me. When the puck goes to the point, low to high, that means everybody's got to find somebody. The D down low, the forward down low, you got to find a stick, a body around the net to deny tips and deflections and rebounds. The guys and the women on the point, you got to pressure high at the point. And Kevin Bieksa made the same point when he was talking uh, maybe a month ago on that low to high pass. If a D starts to walk the line, that initiates a man on man coverage. So there's lots of different ways to go at it. It's kind of a pick your poison thing as, as a coach. Um, but definitely Boston is a handoff at the hash mark team. I was watching them this week, actually. It's kind of funny. He made a bunch of notes in the, in the first two periods of the first game, how differently they play in their own zone, the Islanders in Boston. It's almost diametrically opposed. But um, but anyway, um, it's a pick-your-poison type of thing. I, I think I think you were next, Wally, and then Tom, but whatever. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to talk about this related to the female curriculum. Rick, I shared the evaluation for development document yesterday. But, Tim, we cover that in the curriculum in the branches. It, ultimately, it's man-on-man man when it should be and zone when it should be. And that, to me, is what you said uh, to begin with, in bas- borrowing it from basketball. But teaching and talking to Al about this uh, in minor hockey, you want to get the picture so you can learn to read and react and position. Dom mentioned F1 and angling a bit. Well, if he's angling and steering, F2 knows where to go. Ultimately, that's part of the idea of reading the play and recognizing where to go. And it's not fixed. Um, It's going to be a 2-1-2 when it evolves, and you've got to be able to do that on the forecheck. 
and uh, you you might switch sometimes at the half boards. And for me, it was a policy because of big European ice being too big, too much space for skilled players to not have the defense and run around in big ice. But I, I think the players in the end have to figure it out. And if you give them a picture, allow that flexibility and ask questions, I think they really will in time. So, Tom, uh, go ahead. Well, going going back to the torpedo, I I use two different styles. Uh, I use the torpedo against a team that's you know definitely better than my team because it, it keeps people in front of the puck, but it also has pressure on the puck all the time. And uh, also, it's a it's a great way to play with a lead. And then I'll use the one, two, three, four, five. Um, you know, if I'm pretty even with the other team and this kind of stuff to create a template. But, but as far as staying with the guy or dropping him, I think you have to stay with the guy till the play's over. And then that, you know, 30% of the game when the puck is loose, that's when you can do your switches and this kind of thing. You know, but, but you know, if Dominic's got the puck, I better not drop him and hope somebody else picks him up. So I, I don't think it's good to drop a guy just with the rule about the top of the circles and this kind of stuff. And as Dom says, like uh, Boston can do that because of their personnel. But uh, yeah, the torpedo is great and it's really great on wide ice. When I was with the Red Bulls and Pierre Page was the head coach, we basically used the torpedo and the pressure down the side all the time and, and that left the left side half back was really active coming uh, back door and this kind of thing all the time. And when the puck was up for grabs, he'd, he'd uh, pull back and the left D was always mirroring the puck and it's a great way to create pressure. So, you know, I, I used the torpedo exclusively at Mount Royal. I think we were in the finals four of my five years there, coaching the women. So, you know, I, I like both. It depends on, uh, it's also hard to sell a torpedo sometime. Some some Ds or forwards think they're being demoted if they're, le they're the left winger. And I know what Scotty Bowman used with left wing lock, which is almost the same thing. And then the, nobody wanted to play left wing, and he went to the left side lock. So the third guy could be on the left side. So there's all kinds of options to do with it. But, you know, the, you do have the balanced attack with a torpedo on, on each side. You always have pressure. You know, and a wide rim or a wide pass won't just beat it immediately. So it's a good balanced way to play. Go ahead, Dom. <clears throat> yeah, the one thing I wanted to add on the D zone, so the importance of of second quick and closing it quick. Like I know that was a that was a focus on us as well. So, you know, you go back for pucks, like we want to try to shut it down in the first you know five you know obviously as quick as you can but we just kind of said five to ten seconds like one and two are are <laughs> quick and i know that changed and again that comes to personnel as well um you know the one year we were we were playing it and we had you know subpar d and and center group uh and we ended up chasing around our whole zone because we couldn't initially kill the play and then you know, the next year we had a stronger D, a stronger center, and then it was, you know, it, it was obviously a, able to kill plays quicker and then, you know, having the, the, the five connected to be able to break out. So that's just one thing that I, I hadn't mentioned as being, a, uh, you know, a crit critically important to be able to uh, close, close quick and have that second, you know, the second quick we call it. So whether there's, you know, pressure or, you know, quick support in there. So just, just something to add there. Thanks, thanks, Dom. And uh, you know, following up right, right on that, like the whole second quick thing. I mean, the you know the the D zone swarm is is pretty prevalent with all the teams still playing now, where they'll they'll three on two down low. Um, so the second quick comes in. You can you can afford to get that second person in quick, maybe not on a D side trying to look for the puck because you you know you've got your third person helping out as well. Uh, happens a ton. Uh, with all the teams still in the playoffs now, 
Um, but there's a time and a place, again, for that. It's got to be a little bit of a sort of one-on-one or two-on-two battle for it to happen. Um, and I was just, just going to go back to, you know, and again, Wally and I have debated this for years, but, you know, on the one hand, it's, it's fine to say, because uh, I agree, um, when, when you say it's man-on-man -man when it should be and zone when it should be, it's fine to say that, and it's also fine to say it's up to the players to figure it out, FIO, but, but I really believe it's our job as coaches to help the players figure it out. You don't just leave it all to the players. So that's what the guidelines are about. Like, you know, you, somebody's going up the wall in the, in your D zone. If you, for me, the rule is if you got to stick on them, you stay on them. Um, don't give them time and space. If there's a separation there, then it's going to become more of a build a wall with the, the, the board point forward yourself and maybe the low forward build a wall, keep the puck in the outside. But um, so those are the things we're getting to as coaches is you can't just say, figure it out. And you can't just say, well, it's man on man when it should be in zone when it should be, because the players don't know when that is. You have to help them figure it out by asking questions, uh, evaluating their decision-making with them. So I think that's a real salient point. And last thing, I guess, all of this comes into, uh, whether it's the torpedo or the D zone, uh, I still really come back to Bill Beanie and his, uh, his P S B puck support balance. You want your first person on the puck. You want two and three supporting the puck fairly close. You want four and five providing balance like ice geography balance and that and he does that offensively psb he does it defensively psb get on the puck hard get close to the puck support four and five you got a balance so there's there's lots of you know it's similar in lots of ways to if you want to call it one two three four five and and figuring it out and I don't know, I think, is that, uh, Doug, is that you on now with your hand up? And your mic is off if, if it is. And welcome if it is you. And no response there. I just saw somebody in the, anyway. Um, any other thoughts? Anybody on anything? I'd love to push back on a couple of points. Sure. It's not pushing back, Rick. It's, it's just discussing. I know, and I love it. I, I just I, I enjoy this so much. Um, a, a former NHL coach once told me that there's no league in the world where there's a bigger gap in talent from the top player to the bottom player than the NHL. So, you know, we, we've talked quite a bit. Um, you know, Dom, you talk a lot about the NHL and, and kind of playing man on man. But I think that if we extrapolate that down to other levels, I, I think that there's a, a lot of education. But I say that um, one of the things that I, I love sharing with my players, because it's an easy video thing, is I'll grab all of the goals from a Saturday night um, and and I'll I'll do a whole video on what teams did well to score goals. And then I'll take the same goals. And I turn it around and say, this is the mistakes that the defensive team made. And I am just shocked in the NHL how many times goals are scored or great scoring chances are had because a defensive player is standing five feet away from a player in front of the net instead of taking their, their hands away for a scoring. So my, my point being is that so many defenders – aren't thinking about the man in their zone or the man that they're supposed to be covered in a zone defense or, or another defensive system. And instead, you know, should be just picking people up. So, um, you know, I think that the, the, you, you talk about how a good offensive player would enjoy playing one-on-one -on -one against a defender because you make a move, you get a chance and, and, and you're off. 
I, I will I will say two things about that um, because the biggest the biggest pushback I get about playing man on man is oh my guys on my fourth line aren't good enough to play man on man because they don't skate well enough or or whatever um, they they won't be able to take a good good player but I will say that if you're taking uh, the, if you're defending man on man in the zone you, you're actually defending two men on the offensive player because you've got a goalie too. And, and I think that, you know, if you, if you think about playing in a small area, one-on-one, one offensive player, one defensive player, it's pretty tough for that offensive player to beat the one defensive player and a goalie to score a goal. If you're in a small area game, but you add all of a sudden you add five men offense and five man defense. Now it it becomes, really tough for the defenders because they're not organized to take away good offensive players. And, and I think that if you give everybody the mentality that they have to make sure that the man that they take when they enter the zone can't score a goal, it, it changes the focus on their play to, you know, I got to get the puck back to I'm going to, I'm going to bide my time, make sure my man doesn't score but we will get the puck back because we're all doing the same thing. And, and so I think that becomes the same thing on the forecheck, just to, to move that the other way. Um, you know, we started with some comments about teaching reading and, you know, teaching, having, having players angle because it makes it easier for, the, for F2 and F3 to, to get the pucks back. And, and I, would, I think that we make this mistake that we're telling our players – to read too late so you know you kind of f2 might be flying into the into the middle of the ice down the middle going okay i gotta figure out where the puck's going and then once they make that read and they determine that it's going to go either to the boards or the other side or wherever it's going now they're a step or two behind and i tell you there was guys in blue jerseys last week that were doing exactly this looking for for the where the pass was going from the montreal d and they they just get beat what I try to tell my players in our man-on-man forecheck is that F2 is going right to the far defenseman, wherever he might be, even if he's in front of the net, we're going to take that pass away right away. The other forward is going to go right to the boards, right to that man on the boards that's available for a pass and take that guy away. Now, once you start in those directions, obviously if something happens with the puck, it goes somewhere else. You're going to have to make a read as to whether you can pick it up. Maybe you're jumping right into an offensive uh, opportunity. You know, there's lots of things that, that might happen. But I think that if you give a focus that, that that man somewhere in the zone, even if it's the defenseman picking up, looking for wingers, like I'm responsible for that winger on the weak side. I'm responsible for the centerman that's kind of trying to curl through the middle for a pass. If we can just take all of those passes away, I, I think then we can read from that just as we read from man on man in the zone when there's a turnover. But I think we got a better shot at, at getting the puck back. And, uh, you know, someone once said to me, the best man on man defense looks like five dance partners out in the dance floor, right? That you know who everybody's got and, and you're picking up all your men. And, uh, and that's what I've always kind of uh, tried to go for. The other little thing that I just thought about too on the, you know, taking the, all the men away, um, even if you've got a, a Johnny Hockey with the puck and one man's covering him, um, you know, there's a great basketball uh, idiom that, you know, let Michael Jordan score as many as he wants, but make sure that none of his teammates get a get a ba- basket, you know, take that to hockey, let let Goudreau get a couple good, good chances to score, but if we can make sure all his line mates aren't going to score, then, then we might be able to, to win the game and, and get the puck back a little bit more often. So, and I just have one quick figure it out story. I, I think, you know, there's a lot of figuring it out uh, that we allow our players to do when we're playing man on man. And I think it's a great teaching model for a lot of things we do. But um, I was on the ice with Tim with the under 22 women uh, back in, in 2011. And um, I remember uh, Tim was teaching... Um, just some puck movement at the blue line with Laura Fortino and she was having some trouble with it. And, and I went over to Tim, I said, Tim, tell her to do this, you know, cause it was obvious what, what she was doing wrong. And Tim said, no, 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 no. He says, let her figure it out. 
because then she'll remember it better. And uh, anyway, I think the figure it out uh, idiom is is terrific as well. So that, that's my my little pushback on on some of those comments. Not pushback discussion, Rick. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Um, just a, just a, a couple of comments for me, like on, um, uh, and, and whoever the NHL coach said, you know, no league is there a bigger separation between top and bottom. I, I would agree that that might've been true 15 or 20 years ago. I definitely don't think it's true now. I think there's a way bigger skill difference at say midget triple a level between the best players and the bottom players, if you will, on the team. Like even the worst NHL players now skate well, handle puck well, shoot it well. Uh, they're not as skilled. They're not as high hockey sense, of course. And in, in, in the skill department, they're way below the best players, of course. But I, I don't think that's as true now as it was maybe 15, 20 years ago or 30 years ago when you had, you know, really the bottom three to four or five forwards were mucker grinders, maybe fighters uh, who, you know, were not really as good, nearly as good as the depth players today in terms of their game. And in terms of your uh, two, two reactions to your, your statement, Rick, about shock, how many goals are scored when there's five feet of separation between the defender and the offensive player. And, and I would agree, like, my shock in this playoff in particular is there have been so many examples. And again, when the puck goes to the point, I'm shocked at how little emphasis there is on the emphasis I would put on our low players. When that puck goes to the point, find a stick down low. Do not let a tip happen. Do not let a rebound happen. Box out if you can early. Great, but that's not the priority. The priority is do not let a tip happen. Do not let a rebound happen. I'm shocked at the whole fronting mentality of the NHL and how many how many goals are scored on free tips by the offensive players. Um, there's a gazillion examples in the playoffs this year. Um, and the, the last thing, last uh, point to, um, to to throw into the mix. It's interesting, like when you say, Rick, it's, it's really hard for a one-on-one -on -one player to beat somebody one-on-one -on -one and score a goal. But, it, but the interesting part of that statement is that's what a lot of NHL teams want offensively now. Like they're talking about the stay-away thing. And you can watch Tampa very consciously in some situations. If they've got a one-on-one -on -one in the corner, they're staying away. They're letting that one-on-one -on -one happen because they know that eventually the defensive focus will stray from the man-to-man. -man, and most of the NHL guys are capable of protecting the puck and keeping the puck and then finding a good place to put it. So it's kind of like the flip thing. If the offense wants that one-on-one, -on -one, it's back to Dom's point, if the offense wants that one-on-one, -on -one, why would we want to allow that defensively? Um, so the, it, it's just an interesting balance, push and, push and pull for me as a coach to think about, well, if the offense wants this, shouldn't we defensively be trying to take that away? Um, and on the flip side, and very similarly, I've always wondered for, for years why there wasn't more emphasis on middle entries. We always used to talk about speed wide with the puck. You know, triangulate in the old days, triple drive now. As a defenseman, that's what I want. I don't want you coming to the middle of the rink because it's way tougher for me and my partner to figure out how to defend that. So why isn't there more emphasis now? You're starting to see it. And, and Tom will be quick to point out they have a big emphasis on that in Finland. If you can, on the attack, get to the middle because it's harder to defend instead of staying on the outside. So I always used to always laugh at that as a defender. They always wanted speed down the wall. I'm like, perfect. That's exactly where I want you, on the outside, outside the dots. I have more sort of ability to control that than I do if the puck's coming through the middle. So a lot to unpack there, but just some things to think about for everybody. And I think 
Wally was next, I believe. Uh, hey, is your mic off, Wally? I'm checking. Rick, you had mentioned the story of Tim and Laura Fortino and letting her figure it out. Al, I, uh, I put in the chat a link. It's only 30 seconds. Uh, I was in Medicine Hat at a U8 game back in the day, mentoring coaches. And we had been there, Tim, uh, you know, for the initial mentorship uh, early in the season, doing the coach one type presentation and observing practice. They weren't playing games yet. Then we came in, I think it was near Christmas, and watched them play a game. And I went on the bench. His team was forechecking like unbelievable. And I said, what the heck are you doing? They looked like they knew what they were doing and where they were going. They were organized. It was like, so he sent me a, the video of it. I shared the 39 second video. There's actually an eight minute video that to me is a little bit too much information. Good for coaches. But I, I shared the link on the chat of this coach. Uh, he shared it on YouTube of uh, I call it figure it out, but it's train tracks. So if you're in the right pucks in the right corner and you're for checking. Your left winger and left D don't cross the train tracks. They spread out. That's how you have a shape that they can play within. Now I use center, right winger, left winger, but you can use one, two, three, and the D will be the D. But that concept at the U11 whole ice level L that you're moving to, it's they just won't figure it out without that little nudge of a picture to play within. And I think you'll be amazed at how it'll transpire into everything you guys have said at every level. You know, pressure, support, balance. Uh, your three Ps, Dom. That picture for those kids that age is all they need to do those simple Q words. And I think they will figure it out. So that's my point on it. Okay. Yeah, Wally, I might just add there for clarity in, in case somebody doesn't understand what you mean by the train tracks. Uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, Wally, but, you know, Wally, in, in, in you dealing with uh, especially a lot of really, really young teams, sort of draw a line on the rink board from post to post and from post to post from one end to the other. And that's kind of the train tracks down the middle of the ice. Uh, I think that's what you you mean by that, right, Wally? Yes, correct. Yeah. Yeah, just for clarity. Sure. Yeah, because in whole ice hockey, when we watch them play, they, <clears throat> they swarm. You can put a blanket over all five players. They never played whole ice hockey. All ten. <laughs> yeah, all, all ten. So it's a way of getting that structure of a claw on the forecheck as you hold your hand up, one, two, two, the beginning shape, but it could be a two, one, two. Who's going to be first, second, third? Figure it out. <clears throat> Coaches just need to have a little freedom at the beginning level of a structure to figure it out and ask some questions about what they're thinking and that they'll figure it out a little better. Like when I watch these NHL goals that are scored, uh, and you look at the puck move behind the net, and I think there was a goal scored last night behind the net, bang, just right out front, guy had inside position, quick in. It's happening so fast there. Um, I just can't imagine how quick they have to think to execute defensively and offensively. And um, man on man, I believe at, at that level <laughs> is a, pretty important thing to have the closer you are to your net I believe is low zone offense you've got to really be aware so good good points everyone I think I think one of the sort of valid points to make too is um, you know Peter Smith always he likes to avoid the word structure he likes the word organize but whether we're talking about a four check 
uh, going back to Dom's point, if if F1 is going as hard as he or she can go at the puck carrier with their stick on the ice, it's pretty helpful if F2 and F3 think, okay, F1's got really good pressure. You know, if it comes to it, we know that F1 will cheat to the inside and steer the puck up the wall or will cheat to the outside and force the puck across the ice. It's really, really helpful for F2 and F3 to make quicker reads if there's that organization to the forecheck instead of just making it uh, like a complete read. And, and to Rick's point, maybe having F2 and F3 having to wait too long to anticipate, um, I think it's helpful to have that little bit of organization, whether it's offensively or defensively. Yeah. Go ahead, Wally. Just from a learning point of view, the, 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 when you change, that's when you do have a definite first, second, third coming out of the box. If it's a dump and change, a wholesale change, and that's where, to me, the steering and reading is imperative. Um, now, Dom, I'm going to ask you this question. I, I watch the NHL, and I highlight every game the fundamental skill a defenseman has to have on a breakout. What, anybody, what is that? And it's the first thing you teach your D in terms of tactical skating and tactical breakout passing. Anybody? Well, just watch the games and see how many times they fake inside and turn to the outside. That's your breakout. You're attracting that checker with pressure. He's biting. He might be on you. And you're doing a quick, tight turn to the inside. Boy, that's the first skill to teach and acquire with kids. Fundamentally, repeatedly, and during a game, they'll they'll know the time to do it. But quick, you know, the deceptive, evasive, tight turn, it's got so much value to execution within the framework of a structure. And those are the things you do is you work on those little skills. And I know Dom's specialty is working on all those little skills within the game. And that's where the NHL has gone beyond. And Daryl Belfry in particular has gone beyond in terms of the, the thinking of space and getting to space and creating space, whether it's anticipation with the puck, without the puck. It's amazing, amazing stuff. Go ahead, Bob. Well, just, just Wally's, uh, Wally's point there about the about the evasive tight turn, I think that's where your torpedo breaks down. If you're going straight at a defenseman uh, and you've taken away his passing options, what's he going to do? He's just going to tight turn and skate the puck. And the way these guys skate the puck nowadays, they're going to be gone. Like I think you have to set an angle, an early angle, so that the, the four checkers behind you can get a good read quickly. So... I'm not, you want to cut the ice in half one way or the other, whether you want him, depending on which way you're coming at him, you either want to make sure he's going to turn up the wall or make sure he goes behind the net. And that allows your F2 and F3 to make an early read and take away the passes, and you still have your pressure on the puck carrier. If we're just going to take away passing options, the defenseman's just going to carry the puck. And I, I, and I think the skill level of the players is so high now, trying to play one-on-one -on -one all over the ice, they're just going to leave you in your dust. It's just going to be chase hockey. I, I'm I'm having a hard time buying it, to be honest with you. Yeah, and I, I was just going to touch on um, uh, Wally's point. Wally, I, I totally agree uh, that that uh, teaching the defense, it's not fake inside and go outside. It's teaching the defense the deception to either fake inside, go outside, or fake outside and go inside towards the net so it's not always inside out it's it's the deception that i'm going this way nope i'm going that way or i'm going this way nope i'm going that way and and again i talked about this before uh reed cashman has a great uh developing deception in your defenseman presentation on the hockey coach's site 
Uh, highly recommend it. Really <laughs> terrific sort of one hour presentation with some good, uh, really good so practice video of him teaching his defensemen to, to, to quickly turn their toes this way, then go that way, or quickly turn their toes this way, then go that way, use their stick as a wand to fake this way, go the other way. Really good one-hour presentation. Um, he'll be a hell of a college coach, uh, I think, and Dartmouth is lucky to have him. So I think that I totally agree, Wally, the deception is primary. And then I guess you could add, you know, the deception is no good if you can't make a first pass. So you got to be able to make that first pass on the tape. So, yeah, I just. They're deadly and extremely valuable. Yeah. I'm really deliberate teaching this. So I'm talking Al Ramsey moving into Adam and Pee Wee and, you know, fundamentally this fake inside, go outside. And I, I totally understand where you're coming from. I'm just talking when you do fake and turn and go outside now the middle is going to be more open you've got to keep your feet but there's all kinds of sub skills that have to be be taught there now related to the it's not the torpedo but i sort of look at torpedo as being two on and i see a lot of open space there shannon miller phoned me coaching uh, at a world championships after nagano and uh, live from, she, I think it was played in Sweden, and she said, Wally, what do you do against the 2-1-2-4 check? And, well, I look at numbers. Corners are available. Just corner reverse. Make them come to you, reverse it in the corner. And it, to me, it's that simple. It's, it's uh, I call it geometry and math. It's space. What's more space is available? How do you create more space with the puck, which you have in transition on breakout? And it's those concepts of understanding within a framework that I think precede the execution. And I think that's what we're getting at here is um, how to deliver on doing everything everybody's talking about. Rick? No, I, I think and that's... Dom's got his hand up, too. Go ahead, Rick. Or Dom? Yeah, Dom, go ahead. I think your mic is your, your mic's off, Don. Yeah, mic's off. There Sorry. Sorry, guys. I, I, I was uh, going to share a document just based on um, kind of our... Because we, we, you know, we bantered this about back, you know, system giving too much information and that. Um, and I'll share it. I'll share it with you. And and so basically, as a staff, we decided that we were going to give these to like on. And I'll give you the breakout one. We were going to share these these three points. And like it gets pretty in depth, but we just found that like our verbiage and our communication needed to needed to simplify. Um, and it, everything that we're talking about. And I, I thought it was it, it was interesting. And here I'll share it right now. Um, just based on on the breakout here um and again like again just talking about conceptually and you're talking about the d like Lauxy talking about the d and the first thing that they want to do is to you know like to wheel like they're going to wheel and so i thought it was interesting and again as we were talking about this i thought this is maybe this is something that you know maybe not review now but maybe something we can talk about at a later date but again it just basically you know in the red were the things that we were talking about where it's you know, you're going back for for the puck, and it's just not up to the defense. Like every like the four work for the one, and and we've taken that from um, from Cruyff. I, I know that he would always talk about that on the soccer side of things. Um, you know, and then you know we obviously wanted to play quick, so the we 